Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Now, normally on the channel, uh, we provide buying advice. We try to steer our viewers towards the best buy, whether that be the best $200 graphics card or the best B450 motherboard. We try to ensure that you're getting the most bang for your buck. Today's video though, isn't buying advice. Uh, it's more of a for science type test, if you will. Back when the GTX 1080 was first released, many viewers claimed that it was probably memory starved or memory bandwidth starved, so I decided to investigate. Despite stellar performance, the claim seemed reasonable enough. After all, the previous generation GTX 980 Ti sported a 384 bit wide memory bus, and when coupled with 7 gigabits per second GDDR5 memory, packed a peak bandwidth of 336 gigabytes per second. The GTX 1080 was limited to a bandwidth of 320 gigabytes per second, despite using the fastest GDDR5X memory available at the time. And this allowed Nvidia to get away with using a narrower 256 bit wide memory bus. Still, given that the GTX 1080 sported vastly superior shader power to that of the GTX 980 Ti, it seemed reasonable to question how a reduction in memory bandwidth would impact performance, and this is why many were suggesting a memory bottleneck could be an issue. Anyway, long story short, it turns out NVIDIA knew exactly what they were doing here, and the GTX 1080 had enough memory bandwidth to achieve maximum performance, and we worked this out simply by underclocking the memory while leaving the core frequency alone. Still, I found that testing interesting, and although it wasn't a particularly uh, popular video, I've decided to do it again with the new GeForce RTX series. Again, I'm not expecting this video to be all that popular, but I think our core audience will appreciate the testing. Generally, if I find this stuff interesting, you guys do as well which is nice as we get to create the content that we enjoy. Anyway, the focus of my testing has been on the new flagship model, the RTX 2080 Ti using Gigabyte's Gaming OC model, but I've also done some testing with Gigabyte's RTX 2080 Gaming OC and the MSI RTX 2070 Armor OC. So having said all that, let's check the results out. First up, we have Assassin's Creed Origins. Stock out of the box, the 2080 Ti averaged 64 FPS at 4K, and we see the same 64 FPS when overclocking the memory to a transfer speed of 15.5 gigabits per second. Underclocked to 13 gigabits per second, we do see a single frame dropped, then two more when going to 12.5 gigabits per second, and then a further two frames at 12 gigabits per second. And that's as far as we could underclock the GDDR6 memory. We find slightly different scaling results with Battlefield 1. We're also dealing with much higher frame rates here as well. Right away, dropping down to just 13 and a half gigabits per second results in a single frame lost. And this data is based on a six run average. So while one FPS is still within the margin of error, we consistently saw a single frame dropped with the slower memory. Interestingly, as the memory speed is wound down, we don't see the average frame rate impacted that heavily but we do see a rather big hit to the frame time performance. When going from the stock 14 gigabits per second configuration down to 12 gigabits per second, we see a 14% hit for the 1% low, but just a 6% decrease for the average frame rate. Meanwhile, overclocking the memory didn't improve frame time performance, but it did increase the average frame rate by two FPS. Again, we see a bigger hit to the 1% low result than the average frame rate when underclocking the memory, this time when testing with Far Cry 5. That said, the discrepancy between the average frame rate and 1% low isn't as extreme as we saw previously with Battlefield 1. Interestingly, overclocking the memory had a much bigger impact on the 1% low performance, boosting the minimum frame rate by 3 FPS. The memory scaling performance seen when testing with Strange Brigade is similar to what we've seen in the previous two tests. Performance isn't degraded too heavily from 14 gigabits per second to 13 gigabits per second, but after that performance falls off a cliff, particularly the frame time results. Overclocking the memory was surprisingly beneficial to both the frame time and average frame rate performance. The last game we're going to look at is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Here we see no loss in performance with the 13 and a half gigabits per second memory and almost no change when dropping to 13 gigabits per second. However, beyond that performance does start to fall away quite substantially. Overclocking the memory to 15 and a half gigabits per second also nets us a few extra frames. Running Shadow of the Tomb Raider once again, but this time with the RTX 2080, the non-TI model, we see a pretty minor but still consistent uh, drop off in performance with each underclock step. The frame time and average frame rate performance is impacted fairly evenly. That said, we only see an extra frame for an 11% increase in memory throughput, with a frame dropped for a 4% bandwidth decrease. Then I reran Shut Off the Tomb Raider again with the RTX 2070, and we see no real change in performance by overclocking the memory. And then when we downclock it to 13 and a half gigabits per second, we also see no change. Below that though, we do see a frame dropped every 0.5 gigabits per second reduction in throughput. 
For the last test conducted, I reinstalled the RTX 2080 Ti and decided to run Shadow of the Tomb Raider with some core overclocking, testing with 13 and 15.5 gigabits per second memory configurations. To my surprise, despite the memory bandwidth bottleneck, overclocking the cores to maintain a clock speed of 2050 MHz, the 2080 Ti jumped ahead of the stock core configuration using 15.5 gigabits per second memory. Then with the memory boosted to 15.5 gigabits per second with the cores overclocked, we saw a 6% increase in frame rate performance, opposed to not overclocking them at all. That said, with the cores overclocked, we only see a 5% increase in performance for what is an almost 20% increase in memory throughput. Though we are again seeing a situation where the improvement for the frame time result is less significant, and this is primarily where we are seeing the slower memory limit performance. Some interesting results there, and as we expected, the new GeForce RTX series uh, very much needs the support of GDDR6 memory. The 14 gigabits per second stuff, uh, for the most part, that proved optimal, though we did see a few instances where the factory overclocked model from Gigabyte, their gaming OC card, that did uh, work a bit better with the 15.5 gigabits per second memory. We saw some nice boost to the frame time performance in games such as Far Cry 5 and Strange Brigade. Uh, that said, other titles such as Assassin's Creed Origins and Battlefield 1 uh, prove that the 14 gigabits per second spec uh, is optimal. On average, we saw a 13% drop in frame time performance when going from the stock 14 gigabits per second memory down to 12 gigabits per second, and that is in line with the 14% decrease in throughput. Uh, given that GDDR5X memory was never specced higher than 11 gigabits per second, there's just no way Nvidia would have been able to use that memory with a 352-bit wide memory bus for the RTX 2080 Ti or a 256-bit wide bus for the 2080 and 2070. In fact, had they used 11 gigabits per second GDDR5X memory, the 2080 Ti would be limited to a memory bandwidth of 484 gigabytes per second, and that's 21% less bandwidth than it actually has. It'd also be 8% less bandwidth than the 12 gigabits per second configuration that we tested in this video. Using 14 gigabits per second GDDR6 memory, the RTX 2080 Ti has a memory bandwidth of 616 gigabytes per second. That's the peak memory bandwidth. Now this figure is worked out by multiplying the memory clock rate, which is 1750 megahertz, uh, by the 352 bit wide memory bus, so 1750 times 352, and then divide that number by eight, which changes the figure from bit to byte. Then multiply that figure by the memory clock multiply, which for GDDR6 is eight, and that gives you the memory bandwidth in megabytes per second. Therefore, in order for NVIDIA to achieve the same memory bandwidth using 11 gigabits per second GDDR5X memory, they would need to make the memory bus around 30% larger. And with the Turing die already measuring a massive 754 millimeters squared, they simply couldn't afford to waste the silicon real estate. So that's that really. Uh, like I said, this was just a for science type test, not really buying advice of any description. I just found it interesting and I hope you guys did as well. If you did enjoy the video, well, be sure to subscribe if you're not already because we do this kind of content from time to time. And if you appreciate the work we do at Hiram Box, then consider supporting us on Patreon because as I noted earlier, we really just do these types of testing for you guys. I don't generate a whole lot of attention for the channel. I don't expect to get too many views on this one. It's just uh, something that, yeah, our core audience seems to enjoy. And if you'd like to request other tests like this, some sort of for science type tests, then consider joining us on Patreon because you will gain access to our private Discord chat. And that's generally where uh, passionate viewers request these types of tests. Anyway, thank you for watching. I am your host, Steve, and I will see you again next time.